Uh, good morning, everyone, to a, a nice, cool uh, Tuesday morning, August 16th, 2022. Welcome to the um, meeting of the Regional Transportation Committee of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. We have a quorum, so I call the meeting to order. Our first item of business is to invite public comment, and uh, we are meeting virtually uh, today uh, because of circumstances related to COVID. Uh, so let me just take a minute for attendees to all uh, make sure they have the chance to raise their virtual hands if anyone would like to offer public comment to the RTC. Uh, let me ask you, would anybody who's in attendance like to offer us public comment up to three minutes? Seeing none. Okay, just one more look, seeing none. Uh, let me move on to item three, which is the meeting summary from the July 19th RTC meeting, which is attachment A in your packet. I hope everybody had a chance to look at it. And um, I had no objection to it. Does anybody have any corrections or uh, uh, clarifications to the meeting summary? Very detailed. Uh, thank you, Cam. Seeing none, uh, we will accept the uh, meeting summary. The first action item, uh, Josh Schwenk is going to... Uh, go over the uh, UPWAP for us, the amendments to the UPWAP, uh, Unified Planning Work Program, which I just had a chance to look over this morning through my bleary eyes. And uh, Josh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, just as a reminder, the Unified Planning Work Program or UPWP, not UPWAP, um, is the work program for Dr. Cog's Metropolitan Planning Organization functions. Uh, so it is a federally required document um, sorry, trying to, there we go. Um, oh, and that, sorry, one second here. Why? Okay, well, um, here's the, here's the memo on your screen. For some reason, when I try to, uh, increase the size, it's taking me back to the, uh, cover sheet, but hopefully that's okay. Um, so the UPWP uh, essentially includes all of the transportation planning related tasks that are conducted within the Denver region over a two year period. Our current uh, document covers fiscal years 2022 and 23. It was adopted in July of last year and then amended this past February. So we regularly uh, provide this document to staff internally for review just to ensure that it remains current remains accurate uh, as of the tests that they're actually conducting. And so that's really the impetus for bringing this proposed amendment to you this morning. Um, staff reviewed the document and uh, determined several um, fairly minor clarifications, some changes to language, but also some additional tasks and deliverables. So just some uh, high level highlights. Uh, some of the largest changes are to uh, the section on the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan just to ensure that we're fully accounting for the greenhouse gas amendment process that uh, is currently ongoing, um, that you'll hear more about here uh, in a minute, um, as well as the section on the transportation improvement program, since we're going through a slightly revised process this time, uh, just accounting for uh, that changed process and the additional staff time devoted to that. Um, some other uh, just Items that have been added include um, an equity, an update to the equity analysis that we put the transportation improvement program and RTP through just to ensure that our investments are equitably distributed throughout the region. Um, so we're looking at updating that process to ensure that that is uh, accurate, that it's meaningful, that it uh, gives us something that we can uh, really ensure is meaningful for the region. And so that process is underway and we wanted to make sure that was included in the document. Um, we've added a new TDM strategic plan covering TDM activities throughout the region as a deliverable in 2023, um, as well as an update to our transportation planning in the Denver region document, uh, which is the document that really covers uh, the full range of Dr. Cog's planning activities, our coordination with our partner agencies, sort of how the sausage is made in terms of all of the things that we do, uh, providing that to our partners and the public so that they can understand our processes. Um, so that's kind of high level. There are several other smaller changes, uh, but with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. There's also a motion available in your packet and 
on your screen if you're able to see it in this uh, smaller version. Uh, certainly, thank you, Josh. Also, the packet is available on the website. Uh, I've got it on my other screen here, so it's a little easier to read. Uh, if anybody wants to do that, uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, do we have any questions on it? Uh, uh, Josh, I would just like to thank you for the, uh, the redlining, uh, which made it very easy to uh, identify the changes. And some of them just seem so, you know, I, I can't believe uh, what it takes to go through there and make all those small edits, let alone the, the, the few major ones that you've done. Any questions on this? Seeing none, would someone like to raise their virtual hand to make a motion uh, that's on the uh, uh, that's on the uh, agenda there? Uh, Director Levy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I move uh, to recommend to the board of Dr. Cog the proposed amendments to the fiscal year 2022 to uh, 2023 uni unified planning work program. Thank you, Director Levy. Director Shaw. I second that motion. Thank you very much. We have a we have a motion and a second. And just before we vote, a reminder or uh, just to notify folks that this will, uh, because there is no board meeting tomorrow, August meeting was canceled. This will be on the agenda for uh, Doug. Correct me if I'm wrong. A special board meeting on September seventh. Uh, well, the sir. work, yeah, the work session will be a special board meeting as well uh, in order to uh, take this action up and a few other items. So uh, let me call for the vote. All in favor of the motion, uh, please uh, say aye. 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 If any are opposed, please say no. If there are any abstentions, please say abstain. Hearing none, uh, this will go forward to the board at the special meeting on September 7th. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, now we're into our informational briefings. Jacob Rieger, you're up first with uh, the uh, greenhouse gas analysis update. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Let me get my presentation shared. Okay, hopefully everyone has seen that in presentation mode. Again, good morning. Uh, thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. We wanted to give you one more update on our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Work. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. The documents are out for public comment. Um, so we wanted to catch you up with where we're at um, and talk about our public comment period and the adoption process. Um, so I'll just quickly go through this one. You've seen this before. This is just kind of review of our overall strategy framework to demonstrate compliance with the state greenhouse gas planning standard. Um, as you've heard me say at multiple meetings, and I think one of the big takeaways of our work on this in the last six months is that it doesn't just take two or three or five you know, strategies. It takes, it really does take this framework of multiple strategies, 15 or 20 things all together um, to be able to demonstrate compliance through a variety of techniques. So this just attempts to illustrate the major thematic um, strategies that we've been working on and that we've discussed together over the last six months. I won't go through these today, um, but just as illustrated in sort of this, you know, layer, layer analogy, um, our mitigation action plan kind of at the bottom um, is sort of that last gap uh, or that last uh, set of strategies to fill the remaining gap uh, to demonstrate compliance. When you put all of that together, um, this is the table that results. Um, this is the table that's in our greenhouse gas transportation report. Um, that's out for public comment. Um, again, everything here is in million metric tons. Um, just quickly, we don't want to do a lot of math at 8.30 in the morning, but just to orient you um, to this based on the work that we did through most of the strategies, that's the first row, the updated modeling, network updates, programmatic funding that's in the plan, uh, observed land use, uh, residential densities, you know, those sorts of strategies that we've talked about. That's the first row, and you can see the uh, reductions, <clears throat> excuse me, that result from that. Um, we also took some care to, as we've talked about, we were trying to, uh, through some project changes and financial plan changes in the 2050 RTP, we were trying to free up about $900 million of additional investment into additional uh, programmatic strategies. So the second row uh, sort of talks about that, um, bicycling, walking, complete streets, retrofits, signal timing, um, and a little bit from CDOT bus staying within the Dr. Kong MPO area. Um, you can see the emission reductions that result from that. Again, they look small, but million metric tons, um, every ton matters uh, to help get us there. And then the mitigation action plan, which we spent a lot of time talking about, is the third row and the reductions associated with that. Just to be transparent, as I said, this is the table that was published 
um, for our public comment review period. Um, some eagle-eyed observers might note that we're showing mitigation action plan um, reductions for the 2025 analysis here. That is incorrect, and I apologize for that. Um, we have published a revised table on our social pinpoint uh, website and a RATA sheet just to make clear that 0.02 that you're seeing for 2025, um, not actually including that as part of the mitigation action plan uh, because we don't need the mitigation action plan to demonstrate compliance for the 2025 analysis here. And you'll actually see that when you add everything up and you look at the black bold row, the total greenhouse gas reductions, again, in million metric tons, and then you compare that with the bold red row just beneath it, these are the reduction levels that are specified for us in the greenhouse gas planning rule. So we want those sort of black bold number to be bigger um, than the red bold number, which they are for each analysis here. And particularly for 2025, you see it's, it's significantly bigger. So that number should be 0.68 for 2025 is the total reductions, but wanted to show you what was in the packet and what was initially on the website. Um, but again, definitely demonstrate compliance uh, for the 2025 analysis here and for all of the years um, that the rule requires of us. Um, in terms of the plan itself and all the work we've been doing and how does that, how does that affect the plan? How does the plan change? So when we adopted the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan back in April um, of last year, we had the document itself, which is four chapters, about 180 pages or so. And then we had, I think, 19 appendices, if we count the letters, appendices A through S, which included, you know, just a variety of information, more technical details, documentation and methodology. Um, it particularly included our air quality conformity determination documents, which we do um, every time we make a major change or update to the plan. In this process this year, what we're now calling the 2022 update to the plan, um, several things that we've done to encapsulate all the work that staff has done over the last six months. Obviously, there's been some routine updates to the plan document itself. Um, some routine and minor updates to a few of the appendices. For example, we updated the financial plan appendix. Um, obviously, as I said, every time we change the plan, uh, major update to the plan, we, um, we redo the air quality and update the air quality conformity documents. Um, so that's still Appendix S, but we've updated those documents. And then what's new based on the requirements of the rule, the rule requires that we publish a greenhouse gas transportation report, which I'll talk about in a moment. And of course, the mitigation action plan, which is actually an appendix according to the rule uh, to the GHG transportation report, uh, which became Appendix T um, of the overall plan. Um, so just a little bit on the report overview that's required by the rule. <clears throat> Um, obviously, it documents our analysis and our proposed strategies for compliance. Again, everything that we've been working through together the last six months. It contains emissions analysis for the adopted 2050 plan, because that's how the rule defined our baseline, the plan as adopted and modeled at adoption, and then the proposed updated plan based on all the work we've done uh, and the emissions reductions that I've just shown you. Um, it documents our specific strategies and the plan changes to meet the reduction levels. Um, and as I said, it includes the mitigation action plan as an appendix as required by the rule. Um, and it contains other appendices within the GHG report itself, documenting our focus model, our travel demand model, and the EPA moves model um, that we're using in, in Colorado to demonstrate compliance, which we also use for air quality conformity. Um, we also have an appendix dedicated to our public and stakeholder engagement, um, and there are other appendices related to these topics, again, as part of the GHG report. So just quickly um, through, uh, just to walk you through the GHG transportation report itself, um, just to kind of diagram what's in that report. Um, it's not a super long read. I think it's about 16 pages for the report itself, um, but uh, some pages are added, of course, with all the appendices. Talks about the purpose, background, our role and our planning framework. Um, talks about our tools to model greenhouse gas emissions, um, which again was our focused transportation model. Uh, for the land use work that we did, we use our urban SIM. Uh, model, households and jobs model, and then the EPA moves model, the motor vehicle emissions model uh, from EPA. Um, the process of modeling greenhouse gas emissions, again, I talked about setting the baseline, our 2050 RTP project and program investment changes, um, the programmatic funding that I spoke about, um, our land use updates reflecting observed housing data, residential density, and the emissions results. Um, additional programmatic investment, again, I talked about that, the additional $900 million um, that we reallocated in the plan and the, showing the analysis of uh, the emission reductions um, associated with these four things. Again, the signal timing, a little bit of CDOT busting expansion within the Dr. Cog MPO area, 
bicycle pedestrian facilities and complete streets retrofits. Um, we use policy directive 1610, um, which applies to mitigation measures, but we used it because it is uh, sort of a handy um, reference for um, methodology calculation to estimate the emission reductions associated uh, with these programmatic investments. Um, and then here are the appendices that are in the plan. I won't read these all out to you. Um, but again, the point here is just sort of the documentation, um, the transparency and the completeness of our work uh, related to our greenhouse gas analysis. Um, in terms of our public comment period and our adoption schedule, uh, we started the public comment period on September 7th. It will run through the end of the day on September 6th. So 31 day public comment period. Um, <clears throat> At the beginning of the public comment period, we submitted uh, the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report and the Mitigation Action Plan um, to the Transportation Commission that is required of us within the Greenhouse Gas Rule. We also submitted the GHG Report to the Air Pollution Control Division at CDPHE, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, um, to review our technical work related to the um, emissions work, to the greenhouse gas work that is also required of us by the rule. Um, on September 7th, as, um, as the uh, chair referenced, we will have a special board meeting. It'll be a virtual meeting at 4 p.m., a uh, special Dr. Cog board meeting for our public hearing, as well as other agenda items, but our public hearing for, um, for our public comment period for the uh, updated uh, 20, 2050 regional transportation plan for our 2022 update. And then uh, we will present to the Transportation Commission at its September meeting. And then uh, for our adoption process at Dr. Cog, our Transportation Advisory Committee will meet on September 19th. Um, this group, you all will meet on September 20th, hopefully to recommend adoption. And then our board uh, will hopefully take action on September 21st um, to adopt the, the revised 2050 RTP. And that's so we can meet the October 1st deadline that's specified for us within the rule. Um, I want to talk a little bit about public and stakeholder engagement. Um, so much of our time together has been on technical things, but we've been doing public engagement work, stakeholder outreach through this process. We have a lot planned during the 30-day public comment period. Um, as we've been doing the work over the last six months, we've had a lot of updates, of course, to Dr. Cock committees, uh, to our board, to our sub-regional county transportation forums. We've had a lot of significant stakeholder coordination, um, a lot of sort of outreach and, and sort of explanation of the work to a lot of stakeholders around the region. Uh, we've also reconvened our civic advisory group, which is our group that we started during the original 2050 regional transportation plan uh, to work with vulnerable populations. We've been meeting with them every roughly four to six to eight weeks through this process over the last six months to get their input um, and their guidance as we've done this work. And then during our 30 day public comment period, um, several things that we're doing, our social pinpoint engagement site, I'll take a second to show you that in a moment. Um, eBlast social media, hopefully you've received some of those already. Uh, we have a planned series of virtual open houses. Uh, one is today at I believe three o'clock this afternoon. Um, and then we have another one tomorrow morning. Um, they're all the same. We encourage you to attend one of them, um, but we're rotating them by day of the week and time of day uh, to make them convenient for folks. Um, we met again with our civic advisory group during this 30 day public comment period. Uh, we'll also be making a few other presentations during this month. And then uh, for some of these events, particularly for a couple of our open houses um, and for the public hearing, we are trying to pilot uh, both Spanish interpretation and American Sign Language uh, capabilities as well um, in terms of our accessibility. Um, if I could take just a moment, if this works, let me click on this. Um, when I went to the internet, are you all seeing the social pinpoint site? Not yet. Not yet, yeah, okay. Sorry, let me let me stop sharing and reshare real quick. I just want to take a second to just show you the site so that you can be familiar with it. Okay, let's try that. Yes. Okay, great. Um, there's a lot on here. I'm not going to go through everything. I just want to orient you to the main um, the main sort of elements of what we've done. Um, scrolling down on the main page of the site, you'll see the section to explore the plan. Let me move some things out of the way here. So these are drop down menus where you can see um, all of the documents, all of the appendices associated with, um, uh, with the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan as revised. Uh, we've also been working on Spanish translation for, um, uh, for some of the summary documents so that folks can see that. And then because the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report is so important and has its own set of information, uh, we've made these, we've made that cluster um, or that framework of information available as well. Um, again, the greenhouse gas report and its appendices so that folks can see that. 
Um, and then as you scroll down, folks can either leave a comment on our, uh, what we call our idea wall. And as of yesterday afternoon, we already had about 35 comments. Um, so they are starting to come in. And then folks can actually leave comments directly on documents. If folks want to look at the GHG report, um, they, if they want to look at table 3.1, which is the main table in the plan that shows the major projects, we did a version that showed the changes uh, to the projects to be transparent. If folks want to mark up these individual documents on a PDF uh, commentable form, they can do that. Uh, so we've made that available. And then we've listed over on the right the, um, the open houses, the major events, um, so that folks can know those and get registered for those. So um, I think that with that, that's everything I wanted to present. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, let me ask a, an initial question. When people make comments on these multiple uh, documents on PDFs, many of those PDFs, or they go to the uh, you know, to make a comment uh, otherwise on the whatever that first one was that you yeah, called. the idea wall <laughs> the idea wall thank you I had no <laughs> idea what you meant uh, when they do that do do we have to then individually go to each document and find them or does this uh, platform does this application uh, aggregate them all into a single spreadsheet so that you can see well somebody commented on this PDF and that PDF uh, or do, does it do that? Yeah, it's essentially the second thing you said. It doesn't wow. quite fully aggregate, but <clears throat> excuse me, we set up the social pinpoint site. We used it last time uh, because of that type of functionality. So Excellent. what will happen, Mr. Chair and everyone, is that for folks who comment in the PDF, we've set that up as a um, sort of a special kind of PDF file for commenting where we can then sort of take those comments. It does kind of aggregate them so we can um, port those into a uh, comment matrix, which we will prepare a comment matrix of all the comments we received during this 30 day public comment period. And then the same thing with the idea wall, we can harvest those, um, drop those into a comment matrix. And then what we're going to do as staff, we're going to catalog all the comments we received, and we're going to provide some type of response, even if it's just, thank you for your opinion, we will provide a response to every single comment we receive. Um, and you will see that as part of the additional documentation for the adoption process. Okay, and how long will it take to do that uh, prior to the September 21st uh, board meeting? We are going to work feverishly. I mean, obviously we're gonna work as we go, but we're gonna work feverishly between uh, September 7th, the public uh, hearing, and early the following week when we start turning around meeting packets. So it'll be a slog, but that's okay. We've set it up that way um, so that we can get that turned around and as part of what you'll see um, in, in the September meeting series for the adoption. Thank you, thank you, Jake. Uh, uh, Director Williams, go ahead with a question or comment. Thank you, Chair. Jacob, that's great work. That's that's really yeah. good stuff to see. Everybody's nodding. Um, could you do us all a favor and put a link to that in the chat so that we don't have to stop paying attention here to go look it up? Yes, happy to do that. Thank you, Director Williams. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, that's a ton of work. Jacob, thank you. Working feverishly. Uh, I have a feeling of what that is like because I'm sitting here having been uh, tested positive for COVID last week. Uh, so I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, I see no other hands raised. So let's move on to uh, item six, Steve Cook, uh, Santa Fe Drive PEL update. Hey, I will just kick this one off. Uh, I am uh, Steve Cook, the manager of mobility analytics and transportation operations. And periodically, uh, we like to bring uh, the results or the progress on various studies that are going around the region, especially some of the bigger ones. So this is one of those periodic uh, presentations to you on the uh, Santa Fe Drive uh, PEL study, the Planning and Environmental Linkages Study, and in particular, uh, the action plan uh, that came out of it. So representatives from CDOT will be presenting this and I believe I'm turning it over to uh, Jacob Southern. So Southern. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, right. thanks, Steve. All right, so I'll let him him and CDOT take over. Thank Perfect. you. Um, Go ahead. Everyone, everyone can hear me okay and see the presentation. Yes, I can. Uh, okay. If anyone cannot, raise your hand, but otherwise, go ahead. Okay, perfect. I'm uh, Jacob Southerd. I was the CDOT project manager for the Santa Fe PEL. And then also online today, we have Steve Sherman, who is the resident engineer here at the Central Program for CDOT. So he's here to provide me some backup. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump into our presentation. 
So what is the Santa Fe PEL? So what we did is we studied an 11 mile stretch of Santa Fe Drive between C470 and the junction of Alameda Avenue and I-25. And the purpose of the action plan was to identify transportation issues and environmental issues along with community concerns along this 11 mile stretch of Santa Fe. And then through that outreach and through our study of the corridor, we developed short and long-term alternatives that create a clear vision of the transportation function of the corridor going into the future. And so really what a PEL is, is we do some environmental groundwork and then we go out to the public, get comments from them and hear what their concerns are on the corridor. And then through that, we develop um, a series of projects kind of a la carte um, some being short-term, some being long-term, all addressing this section of Santa Fe. And so our purpose and need for the study, um, and since this is really important, I'm just gonna read it straight off the slide, um, was to the purpose of the recommended transportation improvements from this study is to improve safety for all users, improve operational performance, and enhance multimodal connectivity for the safety. Jacob is frozen on my screen as he looking as we developed our short and long term plans. Okay, Jacob, uh, your, your video fro video and audio froze for a moment. Okay. My apologies. Is it? Can everyone hear me good now? I can hear you now. Maybe go back about 20 seconds in, in your presentation. Okay, perfect. So, um, so I was talking about the purpose and need and the purpose and need of our study was to, um, the purpose of the recommend transportation improvements from this study is to improve safety for all users, improve operational performance and enhance multimodal connectivity for the Santa Fe Drive corridor from C470 to I-25. And really what this is, is our more or less mission statement for the action plan and what we wanted to accomplish through the action plan. I do wanna mention that we had We had some great local agency time. partners on this project. What's that, Steve? Sorry, you froze there again. I was going to jump in, but keep going. Okay, my apologies. I don't know what's going on. Um, so the six local agencies up on the board, they all were financial contributors and all worked hand in hand with us through the project. Um, so they were part of all of our committees and they provided comment along with design ideas and um, helped us also with our public outreach portion of, of the study. So up on this slide really talks about the process we went through and is a very involved process. So we more or less had three different assets of this project. The first being the project management team. And that was more project level staff from all the local agencies I had up on the screen before along with Dr. Cog, um, RTD and FHWA. And really this was the team that did the nitty gritty design um, throughout the study. Next up, we had the executive oversight committee and this included elected officials from all those local agencies and higher ups from Dr. Cog, FHWA and RTD. And this, we checked in with this group periodically throughout the study to make sure that um, what we were doing followed their vision for the corridor and that we had support from them and that higher level support. And then finally, we had a pretty robust public engagement throughout the study. We had a project website up the entire time, which we were able to receive comments from. And then we also did a digital survey at the beginning of the study along with uh, stakeholder outreach. And so we interviewed stakeholders up and down the corridor. And then our two biggest pushes for public engagement where we had two online public events to show the public our process and then also the alternatives we recommended. And this allowed the public to provide um, numerous comments on both our process issues they're seeing on the corridor, things that are working great on the corridor, and then also give them the opportunity to comment on some of the alternatives we developed. So what came out of the Santa Fe Action Plan were three different types of recommendations. The first of which were early action projects. And these are projects that can be accomplished within two to five years with reasonable budget. Um, out of these, we have five multimodal recommendations and four safety recommendations. These are gonna happen in the immediate future. So I'm gonna be spending most of, our, most of my time today talking about the early action projects. Um, we also have project recommendations and these are 
projects that improve safety operations and multimodal connectivity within a 10 year time frame. Some of these need a, have a higher dollar value, so funding still needs to be acquired and stuff like that. Um, out of these, we had 22 multimodal recommendations and 20 roadway recommendation. And then finally, we had future actions. And so we identified that um, you know, a lot can change between now and in that 10 plus year time frame, but we did want to identify areas on the corridor where we thought would struggle or have high congestion or have safety issues in that 10 plus year time frame as land use changes up and down the corridor. Um, because we're looking at that 10 plus year time frame, we didn't really have a lot of recommendations as things can change, but we did want to identify areas. Of So really what I'm gonna talk about today is the early action projects. Um, we have projects that are funded and projects that are not funded. I'm gonna talk about our funded projects first. So we have four projects that are funded through CDOT Faster Safety Funds. And um, these are currently under design and we hope to have out in construction within a year or two. And these four projects are Hampton Avenue sidewalk, Oxford Avenue sidewalk, um, Prince Street, Northbound, Zuri Lane, and Bike Lanes, and then a Crestline Avenue conversion to ride in, ride out. And I have some schematics. These are high-level drawings of what we plan on doing in these locations. Um, obviously, as we kick into design, these are going to get more accurate, more detailed, but really high-level. Um, these are the two sidewalk improvements that are currently under design. Um, at Hamden, there's currently no existing sidewalk on the west side of Santa Fe and along Hamden. And we are seeing a lot of folks currently walking this and you know along a goat path and there is no pedestrian infrastructure for them existingly, existing. And so we wanna provide that connection um, across Santa Fe along Hamden and provide a safer area for those folks to walk, bike, uh, whatever it may be. And then we really are seeing the same thing along Oxford Avenue. There's no existing sidewalk on the south side of Oxford Avenue on the west side of Santa Fe. And there is an existing bus stop out there. And so we really wanted to make that sidewalk connection to the existing bus stop and then give folks a safe place to bike and walk along Oxford. Additionally, we're looking at a safer treatment um, for folks to cross that right-hand turn lane on Oxford and make sure that they can get to that bus stop as safe as possible. Um, the next project we're going to be designing and constructing is the Prune Street northbound auxiliary lanes and bike lanes. And so existing right now existing, um, we have bike lanes on the west side of Santa Fe on Prince Street. Littleton is working to construct bike lanes on the east side along Prince Street. And so really there's going to be a gap there um, across Santa Fe where there's no bike infrastructure. And so CEDA is going to provide that connectivity for those bike lanes and provide that bike infrastructure. Additionally, we're seeing a lot of accidents on this intersection due to folks confusing that HOV lane with the left-hand turn lane. And so we're going to restripe and do some island modifications to delineate the left-hand turn lane more clearly and hopefully reduce accidents here in this intersection. The final project that we have that is currently funded is the conversion of the Crestline Avenue to a ride in ride out. And so we're seeing a high accident rates of folks taking that left from southbound Santa Fe on the crest line. And it is an unsafe maneuver. So we are going to restrict that movement. And those folks taking that left can simply do it at Prince Street, just 900 feet to the north. And so really what this is about is, is taking away a very unsafe turn movement and making this um, T intersection safer for the traveling public. We also do have early action projects that are currently unfunded, and I do want to talk about those today. Um, the, you can see the five of which on the board, but I do have more detailed schematics for those, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into it. What we did find along the corridors, we do have great existing bike and pet facilities. We have the Mary Carter Greenway, we have the South Platte Trail, and we have a lot of good bike pet facilities going east and west as, as well. What we did notice that the corridor is missing is good wayfinding systems for folks to navigate these existing um, bike pet facilities. And so what we're proposing here is, is installing wayfinding here at the Little Dry Creek Trail to help folks navigate both the Dry Creek Trail and the Mary Carter Greenway, excuse me, Mary Carter Greenway Trail in this area. Additionally, what we are seeing is a high um, accident rate here at Dartmouth in Santa Fe. 
And we're proposing some island modifications and restriping to allow uh, the connection of auxiliary lanes through Dartmouth. And so what this does is this allows folks getting on onto Santa Fe to you go through that Dartmouth Avenue intersection before they have to merge over. What we're seeing on Santa Fe is with the numerous lights and the numerous on and off lanes that that merge can become tricky because you're not merging into free flow traffic, you're merging into traffic that is being dictated by a light. So if, so if we can make those merges and weaves longer, then we should have a safer condition out there and see less accidents. This project, we actually identified design funds here at CDOT. So we are currently underway with preliminary design. We still need to find construction funds, but the, once again, the Mary Carter Greenway Trail is a great bike path facility up and down the corridor. Under here, under US 285 Hampton Avenue is the pinch point. This is the, the, the pinch point for the entire Mary Carter Greenway Trail. Here, the trail, pinches down to about four feet. So a pretty unsafe condition for bikers as they're not physically able to pass each other along this pinch point. And so we do have money for preliminary design and we are looking at um, looking at that right now. And the goal here is to widen the trail to the standard width. Um, so folks in bicyclists can pass each other at this location and um, we're gonna decrease the probability of having a bicycle accident here under the yeah. As I kind of mentioned earlier, one of the struggles we have with this corridor are the numerous on and off lanes and, and folks being able to merge onto Santa Fe or get off Santa Fe with all the numerous lights on Santa Fe. And so this is probably the best example. Between Vinewood and Bowles here is only a half mile and we have three different roads coming on and off of Santa Fe. And so that creates a Amount of weaves and a short day. So there's an auxiliary lane from Vinewood to Bowles, and that allows a longer area for folks to merge on and off to Santa Fe. And by providing that longer merge distance, we should see a reduction in crashes. But I believe this is the final early action project that is unfunded. And again, it's just utilizing our existing trail network along the corridor and helping folks navigate that. And, and what we're proposing here are is improvements to the Littleton downtown trail um, and the Lowe's Creek Trail. And so what this should help folks do is folks are traveling up the Mary Carter Greenway Trail. If you've ever biked up and down that, it's a, it's a well-vegetated tr tr well trail. Um, and because of that, it's nice to bike up and down, but it's hard to know where you are relative to the other infrastructure and other locations along the corridor. And so by um, installing wayfinding and then improving the Little's Creek Trail, we should be able to help folks um, bike up and down the Mary Carter Greenway Trail and then make that connection to the Littleton LRT station. So this really is a benefit to bike and pet folks and then also folks taking that way. So we are hard at work already trying to take what we've recommended in the Santa Fe Action Plan and finding funding for those uh, recommendations and then constructing those recommendations. And so we've already had success doing that through the Dr. Cog, uh, the first call, the Dr. Cog TIP application. And so we as a project under Arapahoe County uh, applied for the five projects you can see up on the screen, all bike pet improvements. Um, unfortunately, we were only awarded funding for one of those improvements, which was the mineral station bike and pet improvements. And so just another, another project that I didn't have up here on the screen that is funded and should go to construction in the next few years, um, that is bike and pet related. And we are currently working to apply for more funds for other bike and pet projects, so more to come on this. And why I wanted to talk about this is is this is really what the power of what the Santa Fe Action Plan is. It provides a blueprint for the corridor. It provides a multitude of projects for the corridor. And since we've already done that legwork, um, the local agencies can, or CDI can use the action plan to apply for more funds through not only Dr. Cog, but other grant um, applications and other means and methods of procuring funds. So I know that was a lot of information. Do I have any questions? Uh, thank you, Jacob. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Director Cook? 
Go ahead. Uh, there, um, I'm on my telephone. I can't, um, I, I can't activate my uh, my video. Sorry about that. Um, I had a chance recently to walk from the Oxford station over to a bus stop on the other side of Santa Fe, and so I'm really glad to see that um, you're you're making improvements um, to the sidewalk on that south side. Is there was there any consideration on this end of things for something that was grade separated? It's Th that station in particular in that quarter appear to me to be really heavily used by workforce um, folks and uh, it's just tough even with a sidewalk and and uh, you know walk sign and things like that to to traverse that that span where Santa Fe is was there any thought about a uh, grade separated option for that intersection yeah, I believe. Yeah, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yep, we can hear you. Now. Yeah, so we are definitely so we're definitely looking at grade separation options. Unfortunately, we do not have enough funding right now to implement that grade separation, but we are doing the legwork and design to look at existing utilities and other complications that we would have by grade separating those sidewalks. And so definitely something on our, you know, something we're keeping in mind of. Unfortunately, we just don't have the money for that right now, but the department does, you know, agree with and identify the with the fact that, you know, grade separation is the, the safest condition for bikes and peds. Um, and so something we're looking into further, but unfortunately, just we don't have those construction funds. Right now. Yeah, I figured that was probably it. Glad it's still on your radar. Though. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cook. My son, until recently, till before he moved to Sher uh, City of Sheridan, he works at the Target there in River Point, and he would take light rail to Oxford and he would have to cross uh, Santa Fe every day to go to work. And uh, so I'm happy to see some improvements, uh, but as Director Cook said, uh, grade separation may be far down in the future. Uh, I have a question, uh, Jacob, uh, actually two questions on this, on the Dartmouth, uh, the, the auxiliary through lane at Dartmouth, how does that interact with the uh, right turn on ramp uh, from, uh, Westbound Dartmouth to northbound Santa Fe, because that's uh, that's I, I use that route frequently when I come into downtown, and uh, there frequently are conflicts north of Dartmouth with the merge. No, and that's an absolute great question. And as I mentioned, I'm struggling to find the slide, and I apologize. But as I mentioned earlier, um, these are just very preliminary drawings, and so. All of that question will be worked out through design. Um, and we have our tra traffic folks working on that now. Um, so more information to come, unfortunately through the PEL, it's it's really high level, kind of that 5% design. And so it's more or less def um, identifying if something's feasible or not. And so as we work through design, those details will get worked out. All right, thank you, appreciate it. And then uh, north of Mississippi, where Denver's uh, just put in that new bridge, which I think is Kentucky. Uh, for the uh, development on the east side of Santa Fe. Uh, I don't see any mention of any investments there. What uh, One problem area I've been brought to my attention by my constituents in Southwest Denver is that the uh, bike trail along the plat there has been impacted by some, uh, uh, the retaining wall there seeming to uh, collapse. And I've heard nothing about any uh, remediation or, or improvements to fix that. Uh, have, has the PEL looked at that segment at all? And if so, what, what are they looking at? Yeah, that's a perfect question for Steve. I'll turn it over to him. All right, thank you. The, the yes, hi, hi everyone. The Denver project, there is a Denver project right now that incidentally the wall failed because of investigation for their, their project to fix those walls. So the wall problem was exacerbated by the investigation. So it's kind of, a, a funny irony there, but so there is a project right now. And so there is, yes, the Broadway station development that's doing part of it at the Kentucky Bridge, as you mentioned, and putting in some new retaining walls. And then Denver has a project going south of there to Mississippi to, to replace all those walls. And they're working together. And then north of uh, Kentucky, they're working on another project that interfaces with our Alameda Bridge project there. And then as you continue farther north there, they have a project that goes 
all the way. Well, that, so that project would go to Bayad, that new another bike path project, and then from Bayad up to Eighth Avenue, Phil Milstein. There's another project that they're starting to work on that we are partnering with them on to build the new bridge over the Platte right there, Denver Wastewater. So it's a busy area, a lot of projects, but a lot of improvements to come that we're really excited about that'll make that whole South Platte Greenway Trail a whole lot better and safer for folks. Well, wow, thank you very much. Um, there was a lot there to, for me to digest. I'll, I'll have to talk to my own people about this. Apparently. Everything, basically everything from Mississippi to 8th Avenue is on the bike trail is under design or funded for construction. Thank you. I knew Phil Milstein. Uh, what a Sorry. fabulous gentleman. What a fabulous gentleman. He, des he deserves a much more visible park than the one we gave him under the interchange there. Uh, any other questions? I think I have one more. What is the significance, if any, of the green versus blue font on your maps here? Yeah, so green is going to be a bike pet improvement and okay. blue is going to be a roadway improvement. Oh, great. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Wow, thank you very much. A lot of it for a lot of things going on on Santa Fe. One of my favorite routes uh, uh, to get in and out of downtown. Uh, next up is Jacob again, uh, Jacob Rieger, uh, item seven, reimagine RTD draft long range financial forecast. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have the easy job here of really just introducing Bill Van Meter, but I uh, wanted to give this committee an update on um, the hard work that RTD has been doing as part of Reimagine RTD on their long range financial forecasts. So I won't steal Bill's thunder. I will turn it over to him. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. And I am focusing on making sure I pull up the right screen that I turn my camera and microphone on and that I realize the place that I am right now. Okay, I presume chair that you can see a presentation. Awesome. Excellent. So thank you, Jacob. Thank you uh, colleagues on the RTC for the opportunity to give you an update on the long range financial forecast for RTD that's been developed. It's a draft at this point um, as part of the reimagine RTD effort, planning effort. Um, today, I specifically wanted to talk about kind of our key fiscal and financial findings from that draft financial forecast. Look at a few, three to be specific, 2050 scenarios, financial scenarios and forecasts. And then one of the things that in our discussions with Dr. Cog, when they asked us to present today this information was to um, set some context for the changes that have occurred from RTD's financial perspective since Dr. Cog adopted the Metro Vision um, plan for 2050 and the fiscally constrained RTP. So I'll try to hit on all of those topics and, and in that order, that's the plan and that's the presentation in front of us. The um, kind of key, key takeaways at the start are that prior to 2020, RTD really was operating in an unsustainable approach. RTD was operating more services than we had allocated resources to sustainably operate. How was that being accomplished? A number of different things, but substantially through deferring a number of state of good repair projects to keep um, the system in a state of good repair. Asset management was suffering at RTD. Looking at our long-term financial projections today, what I'm about to kind of go into a little bit more detail on, RTD has limited or no capacity, frankly, to grow bus or rail services or make substantial capital investments or even complete any portion of fast tracks in the next 20 years. Basically, there is a significant gap between public and stakeholder expectations and what our current forecasts say can be provided now and into the future. So this is a busy and detailed table. It presents three scenarios along the top. 
RTD's current fiscally constrained forecast through the year 2050. Second column is the Dr. Cog fiscally constrained. So it's a forecast of what the financial and um, key um, impacts and key um, outcomes and investments are in the Dr. Cog fiscally constrained scenario. And then an aspirational scenario. What's kind of the above and beyond? Uh, the first row shows daily boardings. Recall in 2020, we were at about 200,000 daily boardings. In 2019, to set some context, we were in the 350,000 weekday. And these are those are weekday numbers. Um, the second line shows some information on operating capacity. You'll see dollar amounts on a few of these lines. It is a financial forecast after all. And those financial those numbers are in inflated year of expenditure dollars. They're not in today's dollars. So, um, so just to set a little context for that, but um, in our fiscally constrained scenario, we're not really forecasting any capacity to provide significant additional operating capacity through the year 2050. It's a hard, um, hard message to deliver. And we talked with our board about this. Um, and have been talking with them starting um, in June of this year. And draft forecasts, we'll be sharpening our pencils and coming back to the board again in the October board cycle um, to discuss the mobility plan for the future and these 2050 forecasts in a little bit, little bit more detail. Um, but you can then see across a 73% increase in service over the SOP and 92% and what additional operating capacity that not capacity, but um, expenses RTD would incur to achieve those service levels over the life through 2050. You can see the assumptions consistent with the Dr. Cog fiscally constrained plan regarding the BRT routes. Um, you and the Dr. Cog board have heard discussions regarding, exciting discussions regarding the potential to advance investments regionally in bus rapid transit RTD does have the capacity um, to operate service levels that are the same or better on those corridors than today by reallocating the existing resources in that corridor and more effectively um, using those existing resources because BRT provides faster run times and um, um, more effective services. And you can see number of facility renovations, um, fast tracks capital investments. I won't read every line on uh, every row on this table until we get down to um, the bottom line. And the bottom line is in the fiscally constrained scenario, we, we assumed um, and our uh, consultant team, WSP, assumed that Tabor would remain in place as a restriction on RTDs financial capacity into the future. We wanted to be as conservative as possible in that scenario. And um, Chair, I, I'm getting some, there you go. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Um, so where was I? Uh, yeah, so um, we, we assume to be fiscally conservative in our fiscally constrained plan that Tabor restrictions would remain in place on the base system for RTD, a little bit more on that in, in, a, in an, I think the very next slide, um, which in which we'll get into the revenue assumptions in a little bit more detail. 20 or $2 billion shortfall there, $20 billion shortfall over that 27 year time frame between 23 and 50 um, for the Dr. Cog fiscally constrained plan and a $35 billion shortfall year of expenditure dollars. Um, for that aspirational goal. And then we asked WSP to take a look at traditional funding mechanism for RTD, sales and use tax, and what sort of additional sales or use tax would be necessary to close that gap over that time period. And that's what the bottom line or row line in red um, depicts. There are other alternatives, other revenue options. 
And, um, and so that's something that will, I'm sure, be a matter of discussion with the RTD board and the region moving forward. So a few more slides. Shifting gears, what has changed since Metro Vision was adopted by the Dr. Cog board? Some changes in the sales and use tax forecast, actually an improved revenue forecast from the LEED School of Business for RTD in terms of sales and use tax as of March, 2022. But also some real restrictions as I noted in our fiscally constrained scenario um, due to capping on the base system sales and use tax beginning in 2025 as the last of the T-Rex bonds are retired, capping growth at about 1.4% annually or an estimated loss of about $3.5 billion through 2050. In terms of fare box revenues, we're taking a more conservative approach than we have in the past, both because of the impact of ridership decline amidst and post pandemic, um, as well as our anticipation that the results of the current equity analysis, fair study and equity analysis, the system-wide fair study and equity analysis um, will result in a decrease in fair revenues um, and hopefully an increase in ridership as well. Traditional formula grants, primarily from the federal government that support uh, RTD's operations. There's a big increase in 2022 as a result of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the IIJA, but our future forecasts revert to the longer term trend, which does not keep pace with RTD's growth and expenses, which I'm about to get to. And folks have looked at our one-time COVID care um, relief funds, CARES, CRISA, and ARPA, um, all of those are already committed to pandemic related uses and they're not available to provide longer term or ongoing support for operations. A couple more slides, try to close this thing out. On the expense side, our operating costs and our maintenance costs come from a pretty sophisticated and detailed operations and maintenance cost model. It has a significant increase um, from 2021 to 2022, driven substantially by um, collective bargaining agreements um, that have been recently completed. And then a longer term escalation of about 3% based on industry trends. You can see concessionaire agreements and um, though their forecasts over time, minor changes in debt service. Uh, another Substantial and notable, notable change, which I discussed up front, bears repeating, is investment in RTD's infrastructure, state of good repair and asset management. Notable improvements in asset management information have led us to understand that we need to um, budget more money to keep the system in a state of good repair. And we are using conservative, i.e., relatively high escalation assumptions based on observed industry trends to make sure that we can keep RTD operating in the state of good repair. Final slide, some takeaways. What's all this mean? Hey, we're looking at forecasts to achieve the Dr. Cog fiscally constrained plan of some relatively robust annual growth and in, in ridership in customer use of RTD on both buses, light rail, and commuter rail. In order to accommodate that additional ridership and that growth in ridership over what we have today, we would need to make significant operation and maintenance um, improvements, um, service improvements is what I'm trying to spit out there. Um, and those O&M costs are subject to external factors outside of RTD's control. Um, and they, are, they comprise the majority of RTD's expenses as well. Fair revenue is primarily or the only significant funding source that RTD can influence. And we are anticipating that um, fair recovery, which has historically been low, um, will not be as robust in growth in the future as it has been in the past. So put all of this together, 
some pressures, um, some both some good and some pressures on both the revenue side and the expense side. And you have a trying and difficult time and forecast for our for our TDs long term financial position. Chair, that was my attempt to give you an update on where we are with the draft. Reimagine long range financial forecast. Happy to attempt to answer any questions. Thank you, Bill. Uh, questions, folks. Director Levy, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and once again, good morning, everyone. And, and Bill, thank you for your usual thorough uh, presentation. You know, we've been hearing um, RTD's concerns about what will happen um, when that uh, Tabor debrief thing expires. Um, could you share what plans RTD has to mount a campaign to um, try to leave that debriefing in place? Uh, you know, what I hear is sort of a note of resignation in the presentations that uh, that you will actually have to eat that revenue loss, and I'm, and I haven't seen. Um, much public indication that RTD is going to try to uh, to continue to debruise. Chair, I think um, perhaps um, GM CEO Johnson or um, one of our board members might be more capable of answering that question. CEO Johnson, uh, would you like to take that, please? Yes, thank you. And then if Director Cook is available, I will defer to her. But just for everybody's edification, Chair Busick convened an ad hoc committee focusing on this issue specifically. And the information in which Mr. Van Meter showcased to you all has been aligned with that intent going forward, basically trying to ascertain what the outlook is in future years and then determining what the best course of action. That ad hoc committee that's comprised of um, Director Cook as well as Director Bob Broom have been working on some various elements and their intent is to bring that forward for the full board for them to actually have an informed decision about a path forward. So Director Cook, if she's still available, I will yield the floor to her to elaborate. So thank you very kindly. Certainly. Yeah, thank you all. And um, um, I would reiterate what uh, Ms. Johnson said. We're, we're studying very various scenarios and um, looking at different ways we might both delay the onset and, uh, and also um, to begin to look at a campaign or what it would take to deep bruise. Um, I think the current strategy is to um, hold off and, and, uh, and plan for a, a workshop for the entire board once the new board takes its seat in, uh, in uh, 2023 in January and then begin to look toward the 2024 timeframe for a deep bruising effort. Um, I, you know, I don't have anything beyond that, uh, Chair Busick, if you have some thoughts as well. I think uh, uh, Chair Busick had to uh, leave yes. the meeting at 9.15, so he's, he's no longer here. Could, um... Uh, Chair Chair Flynn, if I could yes. just ask one one other question. Thank you yes, for that. I, I'm just, yeah, I'm really concerned about that revenue loss, and um, you know, it, RTD is so crucial to uh, to all of us in the metro area, both for mobility and um, to achieve the greenhouse gas redu reduction goals that that are required. Uh, so I'm I'm just hoping that you'll be able to uh, find a way to achieve those revenues. I, I was just wondering, this is going to be a very, very simplistic question that um, may be totally off base. But since your ridership is down so dramatically, but, but you have the rolling stock, if you will, to serve um, the, the boardings that you had pre-pandemic, as you see those uh, ridership numbers hopefully increase as you projected over the years, do you, are you able to um, just redeploy the, the buses and, and uh, light rail cars that you already have. So will that, uh, will, is that really just an expense of um, bringing back the labor force that you need or are you anticipating, are you building into these cost projections, additional capital expenditures? CEO Johnson, go ahead. So Mr. Van Meter, if you'd like to go first, I saw you and then I'll add on if necessary, thank you. 
Sure. So um, my response would be that uh, today we're operating somewhere in the um, Director Williams, uh, if she's still on the call, will hate me when, when I say this, but somewhere in the um, order of, yep, there she is, um, 70 some percent of the service levels that we were operating pre-pandemic. We have the capacity to increase that to about 85%, which is a significant increase, over 20%. And as you noted, we have the vehicles available to do that. We don't have the person power in terms of operators, in terms of mechanics. We're still struggling with that and we don't see a short-term or near-term fix for that. Um, beyond that 85%, which as Director Williams would note is 100% of what we can actually afford, that is 100% of what we can actually afford, the 85% level um, of service in that most conservative um, and restricted um, financial scenario. To your point, we definitely would have the vehicles um, and presumably and hopefully we will have the person power that allows us to maintain those vehicles and operate those vehicles at those levels. Great. That's my okay. answer. Um, oh, sorry. If I may just add a clarifying point to that, and thank you very much, Mr. Van Meter, for that response. And for qualifying when we talk about the percentage um, that's something Director Williams I have talked about as well as optimizing that service delivery, but more so an important piece of this is we talk about uh, the rolling th stock and things of the like, recognizing that we do have power problems in reference to, you know, our infrastructure holistically with our rail cars and things of the like. We do have to think futuristically about an investment in our infrastructure because recognizing that our rail cars are approaching their use of life. So as we talk about where we are, we have to make informed decisions quite naturally to bring forward the infrastructure and ensure that they are maintained in a state of good repair. And then um, to that point going forward, as we look at that 2027 timeframe, it is getting both of those elements aligned from the human resources and capital to have them aligned holistically. So while it does seem simplistic, there's a lot of moving parts to have that aligned. And I think Mr. Van Meter addressed that very well as we looked at optimizing service delivery. And I will say, I'm gonna talk about this in my report, but just engaging with peers around the country through the American Public Transportation Association ridership, you know, basically there's a big emphasis on that, but what we're trying to do is emphasize value over volume and recognizing that 65% is that mainstay for most entities and thought through the predictive indexes that they're utilizing that that would have come back by now. So we'll chart the course and be intuitive, not intuitive, be intentional as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Cook? Yeah, thank you. I wanted to add a couple of things that are related to the discussion. Uh, first, regarding service delivery and expanding service, um, one thing I'm placing a lot of hope in is a component of the mobility plan for the future that's coming to the board this, this fall, I believe. And that will include a provision for um, a really proactive framework for encouraging partnerships to expand delivery. The model I look to right now is um, one that Smart Commute Metro North worked with Dr. Cog to conceptualize and get funded. It's a, it's a flex ride that serves the Amazon facility at 144th beyond our current service boundary at 120th in the I-25 corridor. Um, Dr. Cog and Smart Commute Metro North and Amazon worked to identify origins, the, the home addresses basically, for employees on an anonymized basis and um, use that, I believe, to both demonstrate the need for service and the viability of it, and then also to help with service planning. And that flex ride, which is kind of a hybrid flex ride and fixed route right now, is one of our more successful ones. So um, I, I'm looking to the ability for uh, TMAs and nonprofits and communities to be able to partner to expand beyond what we're able to within that framework. And I'd encourage people at Dr. Cog to keep eyes on that as that develops. Um, the second thing is it's going to be a tough, everybody understands it's going to be a tough election for the debrucing. Um, in part because of the gap in, in um, expectations versus what we're able to provide with regard to um, fast tracks and other service options. I'm just hoping that we're able to come together as a region in order to support that and maximize its chances of path. So that's all I had right there, Chair. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Could I ask one more here? I don't see any other hands up. If some if other people have questions, I'd oh, yes. go ahead. Or just um, I I've been unable to find um, uh, easily on the RTD website an accounting of how um, RTD has spent all the COVID relief funds that you've received, and I think it would really help the public um, to um, understand your funding challenges if those um, you know many many uh, hundreds of millions of dollars that RTD received if, if there were a way to see easily how those were spent so uh, I'm just wondering if you can point me to a URL that somehow I'm missing here and if not I think it'd be something the public would really benefit from thanks thank you is that something we could uh, get in the chat or is it something we could circulate uh, later if it's not immediately available uh, to RTC members. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, that information is available. We provided to the board uh, some briefing documents. It's on the website, but it may not be as intuitive to find. So um, that's disseminated on a monthly basis that shows how we have utilized those funds and the drawdowns. So I will um, try to find that really quickly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Williams? For those of you who, who weren't following the, the reference that everybody was making, I have objected to the fact that RTD has been quoted on the 85% and 79%. Um, when we are all trying to get back to reality post COVID, and the example is if you went to the grocery store and they said, well, you can only have 75% of your groceries, um, you, you would all obviously not be happy. So people tend to take the fact that we are only able at this time to provide a certain percent of the service that we have provided at other times. Um, and it, when it's taken out of context, it, it doesn't sound good to anybody. So that's why I've been saying, don't say 79 or 85 or 62 or whatever percent um, so that'll help you all understand and I think that our uh, our esteemed leader Deborah Johnson is going to talk a little bit about zero fare spare the air but I hope that everybody on this call has taken at least one ride without paying a fare during this month. And if you haven't, I'm going to ask that you do that. If you do so much as go out to your closest stop and ride six blocks one way and turn around and ride six blocks back, you need to be able to say that you participated in this um, wonderful initial effort. And then I'll stand back and wait until uh, General Manager Johnson gives her report. Thank you all. Thank you, and I see that uh, CEO Johnson has put the link in the report to the latest briefing from July, and I called it up. And uh, the information I think Director Levy you were looking for may be in there. Uh, it's a 68 page PDF. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, seeing none, let me go back to where I left the agenda. We are now on administrative items. Uh, first up is the CDOT report under member comment and other matters. Do we have a report from CDOT? Thank you, Chair Flynn. I'm happy to do that. It's Karen Stewart, Transportation Commissioner. Um, I will, hi, and thanks for a good meeting today. I appreciate uh, all the information that we've gotten and the, um, the participation that people have with the questions that are so important. Um, as you know, we have Transportation Commission this week and on our agenda, uh, we will be talking about the 10-year plan update and uh, CDOT GHG compliance update as well. Both of these are fairly important to the Denver Metro region. On the 10-year plan, uh, regions one and four will be going over their updated 10-year plan project list. And if, you, if you're not aware of what our region area, geographic area is, region one is the Denver metro region. And region four includes Boulder and the tri-counties um, in Weld County as well. So those are projects under region one and region four. The other regions, uh, the other three regions we heard from last month, and those are fairly the rural areas of, um, of the state. 
the workshops this week will include with this update, uh, an update on the GHG compliance that will demonstrate how CDOT plans to deliver updated 10 year plan while also meeting the GHG standard. And staff will seek uh, transportation commission approval for the updated 10 year plan at the, at the September meeting. So we'll review it this month and then look for approval next month. Uh, we have had an ad hoc committee doing the GHG compliance of which I sit on as well. And um, I have to uh, commend also uh, Jacob Rieger and the Dr. Cog staff who've worked so diligently on this, um, this required addition to the planning efforts that Dr. Cog does for the region. So I really appreciated Jacob's update today. Uh, we also, you may know, um, go after quite a lot of the um, IIJA uh, op funding opportunities. And we have put in as CDOT and also as um, support for other communities, um, applications for some of these grants. And we are happy to report that we recently uh, were awarded a, a raise grant for just over 24 million uh, to construct three new mobility hubs and this is not in our area, this is in the Grand Junction area, Rifle and Glenwood Springs. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. And um, it's replicative of the kinds of grants that we're trying to go after um, at CDOT in order to do a better job with greenhouse gas mitigation. Now, this particular grant that we got funded um, has components that include bicycle, pedestrian, parking improvements, in addition to an I-70 business loop complete streets improvement. And it really will um, increase accessibility conditions service provided by the region's bus system. As you know, we've expanded um, the bus staying and the outrider in the areas of rural Colorado. And um, this will also allow us to extend existing BRT service to farther areas of Glenwood Springs, including Glenwood Springs Main Street, Rafters, major 27th Street BRT station and other nearby destinations. You can see that we are looking to um, do whatever we can with federal funding to improve mo mobility options uh, that are um, part of the whole mobility outreach that we do, uh, funding that we do, policy that we do at, um, at CDOT. Um, other than that, I think we um, also have on the agenda this month, um, wildlife crossings infrastructure, where we're trying to mitigate the safety problems that happen with uh, wildlife. And if you've driven up the I-70 corridor, particularly early in the morning or, or at dusk or other areas in rural Colorado, you know that sometimes wildlife um, crossings, uh, without wildlife crossings, there can be the potential um, for crashes that are both detrimental to the animals, but um, also to um, the drivers and passengers of vehicles. And then finally, we're talking about CDOT workforce staffing and housing needs. And we at CDOT are just like RTD and just like many of the communities, particularly counties, who are looking at a decline in workforce and the, the needs are there and how do we, um, how do we make it appealing for people to work for, for CDOT um, and um, realistically work for CDOT if their work is in mountain towns where the cost of living is so high that they can't afford to live there offset by their, um, by their salaries. So all of those, and you can um, tune in virtually if you'd like to, it's posted on the CDOT website. We have workshops on Wednesday and uh, the formal CDOT hearings on Thursday. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Stewart. Any questions for CDOT? Seeing none, uh, the next item up is uh, even more good news from RTD uh, with the RTD report. Uh, do you have any additional <laughs> good news for us? No, it was funny, Mr. Chair. Um, first, before I delve in, um, I know uh, Director Williams and I were communicating. Um, I wanted to see if Director Cook had anything she'd like to share prior to uh, me delving in. Director Cook, go ahead. No, I don't. Thank you, Phil. Okay, thank you very kindly. 
Um, so first and foremost, wanted to provide an update on Zero Fare for Better Air, recognizing that this is an anecdotal report um, in the sense that uh, as we look at uh, automatic passenger counts and things of the like, that we do not take that information on a day-to-day -day basis for a compilation. But with that being said, one thing's for certain as we have engaged with the myriad of different audiences, a lot of uh, audiences uh, comprising of you all, uh, individuals have been utilizing the service as Director Williams made reference to. I know there was a group that came down just last week um, from the Boulder area taking the Flatiron Flyer, folks from TMAs, TMOs, as well as electeds that are utilize the system through uh, the environmental community. They have been um, organizing rides as well, uh, trying to make it fun and engaging in the sense of basically being able to patronize businesses and other establishments uh, by means of utilizing uh, public transport. More specifically, as we have engaged with our employees, uh, have received some feedback uh, collectively in the sense that their strength in numbers and that they have had, for all intents and purposes, a better experience than anticipated. Um, not everything is rainbow sprinkles and uh, unicorns. However, we have seen a slight uptick in vandalism in the sense of people like throwing rocks at our vehicles, kicking doors and things of the like. But holistically, as it relates to our union partners, um, as well as community partners as a whole, uh, the experience has been embraced um, and I uh, remain optimistically hopeful that a small portion of that population that have tried uh, the services for the first time will leave their single occupant vehicle behind and just leverage utilizing transit once or twice a week with the hope that then in turn, we can help reduce those vehicle miles traveled. Uh, keeping in mind that we don't have a baseline. I know there's been quite a bit of increase uh, wondering how are we gonna garner what success looks like, recognizing that we have been in some interesting times. We look at this as the great reset as we go forward with transit um, holistically. So we'll provide more information and quite naturally we'll have a report. I know I don't wanna steal uh, my colleagues Thunder or Dr. Cog. I know uh, Doug Rex and his team are preparing to do some customer intercepts uh, to garner a better understanding and recognizing where we are, that these surveys won't necessarily be statistically valid, but will give us a flavor for individuals' appetites. And we in turn will be leveraging um, surveying as well as we go forward that will be included in a report that we're giving to the um, Colorado Office of Energy. Um, and then more specifically making that available to the public Another um, element that I wanted to touch on really quickly as we talk about um, utilizing uh, public transportation, um, there are you know hesitancies with some uh, demographics in the sense that there are so many different societal issues that play public transit nowadays. It's not just in just to Denver, but throughout the country with vulnerable populations. Um, two weeks ago, RTD hosted a forum whereby uh, different transit properties happen to meet here in Denver. And we talked about the different techniques and uh, collaboration with uh, health and human services and different entities as we look to capitalize on lessons learned, how to mitigate these issues that have basically spilled over into transit since we are an extension of the streets of the communities in which we serve. And we had representation from you know, Los Angeles Metro, TriMet out of Portland, Sound Transit in Seattle, San Diego MTS, Cap Metro out of Austin. So it was around the country. And interestingly enough, um, the comments shared by other transit professionals, they thought our system was really clean. So it's all about perspective um, as we go forward. So I wanted to share that information. And then uh, the American Public Transportation Association um, is hosting um, a technology conference here in downtown Denver at the Sheraton. It's really Aptus preeminent transportation technology conference. And uh, it kicked off yesterday and basically uh, talking really about the future of the industry, but really focusing on innovations and in mobility and technology, such as safety, security, cybersecurity, micro transit, demand response, transit autonomous and zero emission vehicles, as well as innovations in equitable fair payment systems. And so last but certainly not least, I did want to 
acknowledge Bill Van Meter. Um, several of you may know that Bill shared with me um, on August 1st, his intent to retire effective September 2nd after 31 years of service here. And I'm sure that you would agree in reference to Bill Van Meter and his contributions to uh, the public transportation arena here in the greater region uh, that he has been part of you know, the FTA New Starts and Small Starts grant program, uh, various projects, Southwest, Southeast, West Eagle, uh, as relates to you know, fast tracks, and I can just speak from my vantage point in my limited two years here, he has been such, um, such a tremendous asset to our organization and to our region. And so I wanted to take this opportunity because he doesn't like talking about himself that I would acknowledge him in your presence and say that um, we are going to miss him. However, I am excited for him and it's very bittersweet because I know he has worked here more than half his life and his wife deserves <laughs> to have him so they can you know, spend the rest of their years living their best lives. So if you could join me in giving Bill Van Meter a round of applause for his dedication, I would greatly appreciate that. Certainly. So Thank with you. that, that concludes my report. And I know Bill doesn't like to talk about himself. So, you know, I don't want to put him on the spot, but Bill. <clears throat> Just a few quick thoughts. Thank you very much, Deborah. I, um, yeah, I, I was just um, chatting on the <clears throat> side with Chair Flynn and <clears throat> losing my voice, not because I'm choked up, although I have been on uh, about this decision just because I'm, yeah, I'm okay. Um, I've enjoyed working with the people, dedicated people at Dr. Cog, dedicated people at the Colorado Department of Transportation, local governments folks, and particularly RTD and the RTD team um, from the board of directors down through my team and everyone who all have the best interests of the health and vitality and equity of the region. And um, I'm gonna miss all of this. Um, so I'm excited about the future, um, but I'm also a little melancholy, so thank you. Thank you, Bill. I had the uh, pleasure and honor of uh, working with or around Bill for the five, little over five years that I was at RTD. And before that, when I was a journalist and uh, trying to dig information out of him and other folks down at uh, RTD and uh, also have the uh, honor of having Bill, unless you've moved, uh, as a constituent in my council district. Uh, so I hope you enjoy your retirement and uh, thank you for all your thank you for all your dedicated work. A true uh, a true public servant uh, with uh, the good of the region at, at his heart. Uh, Director Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. I'd like to also jump on that bandwagon, Bill. Thank you, sir. So very much for you've been a tremendous partner for Dr. Cog through the years and and a, a personal friend of mine. And I want to thank you, sir, so very, very much for your consummate professional, but more than anything, you're a better human being. And we we really do appreciate everything you've done for this region over the past 31 years. And and we may be calling periodically to tickle your brain because uh, so having that historical perspective is pretty good. Thank you, sir, so very much. I'll be in touch with you soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, any other matters from members, member comments? Seeing none, our next meeting is September 20th. And seeing no other business before the RTC, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of this uh, cloudy and cool day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Have a good day, everyone.